ننتقل مباشرة للجلسة الثالثة وهي بعنوان تفكيك الاستعمار في دار ناسة فلسطين في ألمانيا يدير الجلسة دكتور سامي الخطيب وحضورا هنا دكتورة سارة البلبيسي سأعرف بالدكتور سامي الخطيب كونه له المحاضرة الثانية دكتور سامي الخطيب هو باحث مشارك في المعهد الألماني للشرق الأدنى في بيروت وعضو مؤسس في معهد بيروت للتحليل النقدي والبحوث شارك في تحليل مجلد النقد رهانات الشكل 2020 وله كتاب بالألمانية بعنوان غائية بلا نهاية تشويه والتر بنيامين للمسياني 2013 تفضل مرحبا الو اوكي مرحبا اند سوري فور سبيكينج ان انجلش ماي عربيك از نوت جود انف ماي نيم از سامي خطيب ايم ذا تشير اوف ذا نيكست بانل اند اي ويل بريفلي انتروديوس ذا ثري سبيكرز اكشلي ون سبيكر از اولسو مي سو اي ليف ات تو زارا تو انتروديوس ذا ثيرد ون از يو سو اون ذا بروجرام Uh, the panel is called Decolonizing uh, the Study of Palestine in Germany. It is a proposal that was uh, made in, uh, by the way, is the feedback, no? A little bit, I should move away, it's better? Mm -hmm. oh. It's okay? Echo, echo. Echo, eh? The echo. No? Well, let's start. Ah, of course. Technology. Okay. Um, so you have changed it a little bit. So, so the abstracts and the papers are not completely what we uh, proposed uh, before October the 7th, and uh, we've all felt we had to rework the titles a little bit. So you'll see it is not only about uh, the topic of decolonizing the study of Palestine. Almost, um, we we'll talk about it later. Okay. Uh, my co-panelists are to my right. Uh, Sarah Bulbasi, a research associate at the Orient Institute, OIB, here in Beirut. And before joining the OIB, she was a research associate at the Ludwig Maximilians University uh, in Munich and a coordinator of the DAD University Dialogue Group Violence, Forced Migration, Exile, Trauma in the Arab World and in Germany. Her publications include Taboo, Trauma and Identity, Subject Constructions of Palestinians in Germany and in Switzerland, uh, 1960 to 2015, and uh, Palestine in, in the Imagination of the Imperial German Self, Gustav Dahlmann at the Bavarian War Archive, uh, also from 2020. Uh, online behind me, you see my colleague from Berlin. Hi, Hanan. studies at Bard College Berlin, where she teaches Courses in Middle Eastern Studies, International Politics, Critical Theory, Postcolonial th Studies, Visual Cultures, and Cultural Studies. She serves on the board of the directors of the Palestinian Museum in Ramallah and the editorial collective of the Journal of Visual Culture. She's also contributing editor to the Jerusalem Quarterly. And her book, The Politics of Art, Descent and Cultural Diplomacy in Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan, was published by Stanford University Press in 2021. Um, my name is Sami Khatib, and uh, I will introduce myself. Uh, yes, I, I, I have the honor to introduce my dear colleague, Sami Khatib. 
Sami Khatib is a research associate at the Orient Institute Beirut as well. And he is a founding member of the Beirut Institute for Critical Analysis and Research, BICAR. He is co-editor of the, of the volume Critique, The Stakes of Form, 2020, and the author of the book Theolo Teleologie ohne Endzweck, Walter Benjamin's Entstellung des Messianischen, 2013. And I would say, uh, without further ado, we just start. Sala, you go first. Hanan, second. Online, and I'm the third. Is it yes. okay? Great. Yes, great. Um, Tabu and trauma. Palestinians in Germany. Although the Shoah and the Nakba, the expulsion of Palestinians from historical Palestine, which has been ongoing since the end of 1947, are deeply intertwined. And the Nakba is, among other things, a direct consequence of the Shoah. The Nakba is excluded from the German collective memory. The connection to German history is only ever built one-sidedly in the representation of Israel as a safe haven for Jews. The systematic expulsion and dispossession of Palestinians is not linked to, the, to Israel's self-conception as a Jewish state. Moreover, the Palestinian experience of violence is made taboo. When made visible, it is reflected as something threatening, as something that competes with the Shoah and contaminates the Jewish experience of violence, as well as the German culture of remembrance. The, de the depiction of the Shoah and the Nakba as antagonistic prevents the violence against Palestinians from being seen as a continuation of European anti-Semitism. In turn, it allows Germany to avoid having to deal with the present of its history and to position itself as a nation that has morally rehabilitated itself. The taboo of the Palestinian experience of violence is so powerful that not only it, but Palestinianness per se becomes something socially rejected. Edward Said wrote that the Palestinian experience is so unpleasant, so scandalously close to the Jewish experience, that sometimes one cannot even pronounce the word Palestine. This closeness of the Jewish and Palestinian experience leads to the fact that Palestinian visibility feels embarrassing, even for Palestinians themselves that it seems threatening and should be made absent. Traces of this fear of Palestinian visibility can be found in the representation of Palestinianness as deviating from the moral norm, as one-sided, ideological, radical, violent, and riddled with anti-Semitism. In my dissertation, Taboo, Trauma, and Identity, Subject constructions of Palestinians in Germany and Switzerland, I explored how the selective remembering and forgetting, the institutionalized remembering of the Shoah and the institutionalized forgetting of the Nakba affects first and second generation of Palestinian migrants in Germany, where the largest Palestinian community in Europe is living, and how they deal with it. I show that the social taboo surrounding their collective experience of displacement repeats and deepens this violence and makes it a traumatic experience. I show that this has led to dissolution of the self, melancholia, feelings of invisibility, absence, guilt and shame on the inside, 
and self-negation on the outside. In short, a traumatic existence. But while the first generation remains caught in their trauma, their children begin to transform it into agency, reclaiming the socially discarded identity and history and replacing self-negation with a politics of visibility. My work is based on life stories and conversations as well as autoethnographic observations. Psychoanalysis provided me with the tools and vocabulary and vocabulary to explore taboo and trauma in a social science context. Both phenomena, taboo and trauma, are by definition beyond the, the narrative and in silence. Psychoanalysis has dedicated itself to the challenge of finding a language for what actually happens beyond language, but also a language for suffering from the social norm or for the pain that does not comply with the norm. The psychoanalyst Hans Carlson was one of the first to draw attention to the social environment in order to overcome trauma as a narrow medical concept. In his study of Jewish war orphans, he showed that trauma should be seen as a process and structure, and not only as the subsequent reaction to an event that overwhelms the psyche. How society deals with violent experiences is essential for coping with them. Trauma is therefore much more than an individual phenomenon. For example, recurring experiences of exclusion, the tabooing of experiences of violence, and the disregard and systematic denial of one's own perception can have a traumatic effect. Palestinians in Germany experience this not only, individual, not only individually, but collectively. Taboo and trauma are therefore closely linked in the Palestinian context. A second generation interlocutor remembers how she was always mistaken for a Jew when she was a student because she was so free. She had let people believe this because it was more comfortable to be Jewish. The Jewish experience was similar to the Palestinian experience but not taboo. She had built up a, quote, totally artificial identity into which she could put all her pain, quote, end. Tabooing, meaning the repression of experience, was so violent and of such a similar structure to the physically experienced violence of ethnic cleansing that it not only repeated it, but also normalized it thereby giving it a traumatic depth. In the previous example, the necessity of the taboo forced the interlocutor to do what she herself described as a sub substitute act. In order to be able to share the pain of the family history of expulsion with those around her, she slipped into the identity hiding her pain in the pain of the Jewish other. In order to be recognized as a human being, she repeated a form of violence on herself that she experienced repeatedly in society, which is the overwriting of her Palestinian experience with the, with the Jewish experience in Europe. A decisive part of the trauma experienced by Palestinians in Germany comes not only from tabuization, but also from symbolic violence, to use Bourdieu's term. Symbolic violence aims to describe the violence of those discourses that socially normalize and legitimize systemic violence. 
meaning the violence that emanate that emanates from political and economic and economic systems. Symbolic violence justifies the expulsion and dispossession of Palestinians and the seizure of their land in various ways. The violent, the violent act of expulsion is trivialized, presented as controversial, accidental, or self-inflicted, or it is being made undone. By denying the existence of Palestinians in historical Palestine or their connection to the land, for example, the reality of the act of violence is to be erased. Finally, violence against them is morally justified. This is essentially done by a victim-perpetrator dichotomy in which Palestinians are fixed in the position of the perpetrator and moral deviant. They have been and continue to be contrasted in ever new variations as threatening savages, terrorists, Islamist extremists and anti-Semites with Israel as part of the so-called Christian Jewish Western culture and community of values. Demonizing representations of Palestinians went historically hand in hand with practices of criminalization, such as surveillance, censorship, expulsions, especially in 1972, bans on assemblies, the dissolution of student associations and workers' unions. As a result, the violence experienced by Palestinians appears to be justified. Palestinians thus become people who deserve to suffer violence. Many Palestinians internalized this, especially those of the first generation. Many felt that the violence they experienced was something shameful and self-inflicted. In this way, they were not least dispossessed of their experience. Symbolic violence repeated and it intensified the physical violence of the expulsions and ultimately desubjectified them. The insignificance attributed to Palestinians resulted in the fear of visibility and political activism but also in the fear of feeling, let alone expressing, anger and grief. Many are unable to mourn their experience of violence because it does not exist, because it is banned in the society they live in. This led to, melancho to melancholia and with withdrawal from society, from family and other Palestinians. It led to isolation, social death, and suicidal lives. Guilt and shame dissolved them as subjects. The power of the discourses that negated them literally dematerialized them. Symbolic violence not only made the members of the first generation invisible, but also became an important aspect of their relationship with their children. The relationship between first and second generation was characterized by the melancholia of the first generation. Their invisibility was inscribed as an emotional absence in their relationship with their children. This contributed significantly to how traumatic experiences were pa passed on to them. In order to build a relationship, children had to undo the, the desubjectification of their parents and establish them as subjects. Often this led to a reversal of social roles between parents and children. The effects of this role reversal manifest themselves in the children's desire to embrace their parents' trauma. I will quote from a conversation with a female interviewee who struggled with the fact that she was unable to record, to, 
that she was unable to record the story of her father's expulsion during his lifetime. Her account blurs her own feelings with those of her father. I quote, I've somehow always feared that at some point it will be too late. Now we just have stories, and of course I have memories of them, but I'm just afraid that over time they, they'll become memories of memories. And you won't know what was really said. And I don't know if I can, if I can forgive myself for that. But he wasn't the one who said, come on, let's do it. And yes, I think it's a good thing. And now he's gone and taken all the stories with him. And I even said to him in hospital when he died, now we don't have our book anymore. Now we haven't made our film. Of course, it's always the case that when you experience something yourself, it hurts the most in your own skin. I don't want to presume to say that I suffered as much as he did. But I was very interested in it, and um, that's also somehow part of my father's nature. It was somehow not so separable. It concerns me just as much. Sometimes I felt as if I felt the pain one to one, how the pain in its purest form, how the child who is barely 10 has to leave his marbles behind. Come on now, everyone quickly. We're leaving, we're leaving everything now, but we'll be back in a fortnight. And it's simply torn out and that these two weeks are still not over today. To end. Many actors, both first and second generation, begin, began to deny or conceal their identity in the public sphere in order to avoid the pain of being socially stigmatized instead of being seen as deplorable human beings. A conversation with a second generation actor uh, interlocutor shows the double lives this led to, I quote, nobody talks about it. You don't hear it in history classes. I never heard it in school. Our history must not exist in the history of the world. But it is not invented or a wishful thinking. It really happened and most people just don't want to believe it. Most people simply still want to hold on to the version that country was empty, which is not true at all, or we built the country. It hasn't been like that, and I don't understand why you can't talk about that. You always have to pay attention, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, you have to be careful that you don't somehow put your foot in your mouth. You always have to, as a Palestinian, you have to like negate yourself. Okay, so that our life goes on normally out here, maybe outwardly you go along with it. But I think inwardly, especially in the circle of the family, you don't have to go along with it but you also have to talk about it. And for me, it's clear that if I ever have children in my life, that will also be passed on. That's not a question for me. Even my classmates didn't know that I was Palestinian, and that's how I grew up. Quote end. The Israeli mi military offensive in Gaza in 2014 marked a turning point for many, especially second generation Palestinians. The tabooing and justification of Palestinian experiences of violence increased in Germany with the Israeli military offensives. 
the disproportionate use of force by the Israeli army, which led to the killing of hundreds of civilians, was presented as necessary, and Israel's narrative of a war of self-defense was adopted without reservation. Palestinians in Germany who protested against this disappeared as human beings in the representation of an anti-Semitic Palestinian collective subject. This caused feelings of mistrust towards society in which they had grown up and feelings of living in exile in the land of their childhood. While many second generation Palestinians had previously excused the lack of empathy towards Palestinians with ignorance, they now interpreted it as anti-Palestinian racism. They broke with the self-negation that had often been imposed on them by their parents, overcame their isolation and fear of visibility and activism, networked nationally and transnationally, and worked against fragmentation. They also discovered the grief and anger that their parents were denied, began to reappropriate their lost, socially rejected history and identity, began to transform guilt and shame into pride and the powerlessness of traumatic existence into agency. This development has again intensified since the beginning of the genocide in Gaza and its military and moral support by Germany. In the German political and media public sphere, genocide is justified as a war against anti-Semitism, a war which is more and more being extended to Palestinians in Germany as well. Symbolic violence, the demonization of Palestinian identity is becoming increasingly institutionalized, resulting in state-induced restrictions on Palestinian visibility in public spaces and police violence, among other things. For Palestinians in Germany, the, the boundaries between here, Germany, and there, historical Palestine, are becoming more and more blurred the continuous justification of Israeli state violence in public discourse is experienced as an incessant repetition of the collective trauma of ethnic cleansing with hardly any end in sight. Thank you. Second speaker, sorry. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we switched our second speaker from Berlin, Anan Tukan. You, hi, uh, you have a presentation, Anan, no? I do, yes, um, but maybe I'll set up um, the screen and then we can begin. And then when I need to introduce, I'll set it up, okay? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, Okay, so I'm going to start. I'm just going to jump right into it. So in my paper today, I will unravel how imagining the resurrection of German sovereignty around the cultural memory of the Holocaust are constructed by important forms of Palestinian artistic production. So specifically, I ask what art exhibited about the Palestinian experience in the German context tells us about the coloniality of the mechanisms by which Palestinians and their knowledge production are strategically rendered outside of German memory, identity, and indeed consciousness. So by now honing in on the political economy and, and city culture politics that can change and make such a danger possible, I asked how we may rewrite and reconceptualize the interconnectedness of the practice of cultural politics and the political economy of art in the Middle East and Europe, so specifically in this case in uh, Germany um, and, and, and London. Um, in my larger body of work um, on art and international and domestic institutional politics that shape the discourses around it, um, I follow a thread of movements of people, cultural objects, and ideas in art worlds in the Middle Eastern Europe that are always dominated by a politics that is that indeed determine who can speak, who has the right to speak, and under what conditions of funding, networking, and representation they are allowed to speak, both in the Middle East and Europe, as I said. 
um, is to establish disciplinary, theoretical, and methodological boundaries um, that are dominant, uh, that dominate the Western tradition that we have been taught in. Um, we learned that the two entities represent separate geographical, um, represent, sorry, separate geographical sociopolitical realities that cannot therefore be compared or even spent together. So we're working up my way out on what I call it. European and U.S. culture funding, Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan. I argue otherwise in my current research on um, cultural production in Germany, um, and specifically the role of, of, of Palestinian art um, and intruding sort of into public conversations um, uh, in art in Germany. Um, specifically, I propose that freedom in the arts and indeed in the academy, um, as well as censorship, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, and indeed the rule of law i.e. the pillars of so-called Western democracy and indeed European and specifically German cultural funding that I have studied are values that are not only determinate but are also highly susceptible to the politics of identity and notions of cultural authenticity and a shared national past and heritage, whether we're speaking about the Middle East or Europe. So I'm going to talk about a specific um, a case that some of you, a lot of you might have heard about already, which is um, the Documenta um, um, scandal that took place. I won't be discussing the whole of Documenta, but one specific work um, by Kamel and Sohail from Bantle. Um, and I, I, I want to do that because I think it's important that we remember um, that a lot of what we're facing today in Germany as academics and cultural workers in terms of deplatforming, silencing, bullying, and censorship. Um, um, has been going on for some time, right? And it take, it's taken many different forms. I mean, Sarah just spoke to us sort of about the uh, maybe emotional, social um, um, existence of Palestinians, so to speak, and how often that has been, um, in many ways, also um, this vulnerability has been used, right, as a way to censor um, a lot of the cultural knowledge production that comes out of Germany. So I think if we look at specifically on and how much work, if we look into it, and it'll give us some idea of how this political economy of financing works. Um, so back in the summer of 2022, the Palestinian artist from Bethlehem, Hamad Kamalti, found himself toppled into the treacherous terrain of, treacherous terrain of Germany's polyphone. The pages of its so-called intellectual reporting on all high culture and art matters in the country. Without much knowledge of the few years, perhaps without much knowledge of the few years leading up to 2022 in Germany, and we saw the German government impose systematic and mostly illegal top-down crackdown on international artists, scholars, and activists vocal on Israeli apartheid and the illegal military occupation of Palestinian land. Mohammed, um, who, as we know, is, is as a guest still alive, and Hamza bin Rafa, who is his wife and three children, was about to unveil a series of collages in the context of Document 15. Um, perhaps unbeknownst to him, to him at the time, this was soon to set off a public storm of moral panic, media incitation, and public institutionalized racism aimed at those from the global south and their supporters in the north calling for Palestinian equal rights. In this context, in 2022, already pervasive existential anxieties around German identity in the era of migration and globalization translated into an aggressive, into a aggress into aggressive claim cultural authenticity, an exclusive and unique sphere of violence, not of Germany's colonial power in Africa, point of view, but of the more immediate Holocaust that perpetrated. And the imaginaries of an existing, unfettered cultural sovereignty were conjured for the public, for the public amidst, amidst growing recession and a rise in far-right movements. The very idea of Palestine and Palestinians, and ironically, especially their Jewish supporters, were deemed merely by their presence by their actual physical presence, to be a threat to the so-called culture of remembrance, the official policy of confronting Nazi-era war crimes from acknowledging responsibility for the Holocaust. Um, I'm just going to share now my... Um... Okay. okay, right. Super. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll just go on um, from where I thought. Where I thought. So Palestine is actually already um, reappeared forcefully uh, on European streets in the early 2000s with the beginning of the Second Intifada when Palestinians and their supporters protested Israeli annexation threats at the time. Although all European countries are aware, are aware of Palestinian dispossession and have been home to Palestinian diaspora since the 1960s, a shift could be detected now in how the question of Palestine generated an unprecedented security discourse in the post 9 11 environment. 
This discourse fed on to is fed on to new two new phenomena. First, the European Union declared the Holocaust a post-national European heritage and renewed their commitment to memorialization as a form of consolidating a liberal identity after the Cold War. In this process, Holocaust memorialization and the unconditional support for Israel and, as an extension, criticism, criticism of Zionism with anti-Semitism have been purposefully, for strategic policy reasons, conflated and encouraged. Above all, in Germany. Sorry, I call it in Germany. Yeah. Second, the war on terror targeted Middle, Middle Eastern migrant communities by framing them as Muslim threats. Surveillance measures, including disciplinary measures targeting speech about Israeli aggression against the Palestinian Jews, have frequently institutionalized as a form of combating Muslim anti Semitism in migrant integration education over. So, when migrants from the Middle East began to pour into the EU and arrive on German doorsteps in what the Germans like to call their 2015 migration crisis, triggered um, by Angela Merkel's long famous sign, the Aschaffenbach, you can do this. No one had anticipated that with them would come a class of creatives and intellectuals comprised of influential scholars and artists, musicians, and writers, and poets that were already transnationally connected and therefore well versed in the language of solidarity and rights of freedom, having just undergone their own attempted revolution um, back home. So let me just explain that this group, of course, then uses with the second generation um, that Sana speaks about, the Bukhara generation. So they find a common language and a common discourse. Um, and you begin to feel this, of course, then maybe in 2015 and towards maybe five years later, it becomes a, a bit more consolidated um, when these two sort of different groups begin to find each other and work together. And of course, their voices grow louder, the discourses that they propose, the common discourses that they propose also um, become more visible. At the same time, German culture institutions working to carve its space in the global contemporary art world as part of the post colonial turn um, in academic and cultural work gave platform to these voices at the beginning that critiqued Eurocentrism and imperial ethnicity, colonial violence, and the violence of, and the history of science and race that was part and parcel of the pervasive worldview in Germany that eventually these migrants encountered in their daily lived reality. As such, Germany, the country that is Ideas inspired by the post colonial term, and which often find the majority of intellectuals, intellectuals located in and or linked to global majority countries in the South that regard Palestine, uh, Palestine colonization as one of the last remaining colonial fronts in the world. The reliance on global South connected artists and intellectuals contributed and indeed safeguarded the country and especially Berlin's international reputation as a tolerant trendy and experimental type of global post-colonial artistic production as part of the city's self-reinvented process since Germany's reunification. The paradox of wanting to open up to the post-colonial global south by giving it a platform, while at the same time excluding Palestine because of the existential threat it is being proposed to the top-down constructed German post-Holocaust culture memory in this country in the summer of the 2022 Documenta Festival, although there were many stops that led to what happened in, in Documenta, but this really came to the, the fore in a very sort of public way, and, and it also led the way to the attacks on post-colonial studies and post-colonial theory, and or maybe consolidated those attacks that we now um, um, sort of are hearing about and experiencing in, in, in Germany universities and especially academia. Um, as I already indicated, for the iteration of the 2022 festival, the German organizers have, been, have decided to appoint an Indonesian art, artist collective, Ruan Kupa, to, cur to curate the show that year, who then made the decision to focus on art collectives from, from all over the global south through a decentralized artistic curation that would explore the consequences of global and racism. This was a contradictory move on behalf of the German uh, uh, organizers because for all the reputation they had, it had they had invested in, in themselves as edgy and experimental. They also were an institution and deeply steeped in the Western art world culture of top-down territorial propositions uh, that are essentially governed and fully funded by German bureaucracy. So just to return to um, um, Hamad Hawashi's work, the artists had been invited, um, along with the Intifat artist collective from Hudson, to show his work as part of the Palestinian art collective, the, the question of whose contribution to the exhibition that year, who themselves
myself were invited by um, Ruan Rupa. Here you see an installation of um, some of the work. The coming together of the two Palestinian art collections was part of an already ongoing documented research the two were conducting on some very relevant and timely questions for those working in the contemporary art world. What the Ilkaka and the question of funding have been thinking about together was how one can produce, document, accumulate, and disseminate resources and knowledge about cultural practices under the condition of coloniality. As many reviews of the show in academic and cultural journals highlighted, it was the intricacies of how culture and knowledge producers and specific artists living in Muslim creatively navigated their way around the banality of everyday military violence that the question of funding and its effect clearly revealed in their, in their contribution to documentary history. This body of knowledge about how artists survive under the quick effect of colonialism and global capitalism in the 21st century was sustained as a process focused exhibition of the meticulous documentation of the detailed art history of Muslims that was collected. I will show you a little bit of the document. It included the financial flows of art sales, the training and education of artists, and an almost impossible predicament. The rest of the outcome and its effects on artists, access to artistic materials that is prevented from, ent from entry into Muslim, the representation of Palestinian art in global centers, even artists' personal story and story, the border crossing, and so much more than what I've been told here. Anthology specifically was represented with five works from his series, the Hubs and Kermita, 2010 2013, in which he photomontages the well known paintings from European modern art history of the Romantic post Impressionist period by specifically the paintings de la Croix, Millet, Chagall, Rambo in an alienating way with photos from as you can see here. In these works, Israeli soldiers and weapons inserted into the scenes are framed as threatening a peaceful, mostly pastoral landscape and its, peace, and its people. In this one, in one notable example, the Kawashi of the Jacob the scenes of the death and destruction of the chaos from which Lady Liberty rises and that of Palestinian liberty, land leading the people, with contemporary scenes of violence from Israel and in many of the since 2016. The works are part of a larger cycle created between 2010 and 2013, the period that we know saw several episodes of Israeli wars and bombings on the husband. In the very extensive accompanying text to these works, which were represented, I'll show you like this, so that is not really the story. Um, and how she reflects in detail on what it means to live and work as an artist in Gaza and reports on his production condition. So I'm quoting here. Due to political service circumstances, one cannot simply paint flowers, but must also reflect on the surrounding reality. Almost in, uh, end of the quote, almost in anticipation of the impacts he would receive, the question of funding displayed in a large text adjacent to Kawashi's work, how him and his fellow artists knew that a political meaning would always be projected onto their work, regardless of whether they intended it or not. That is how the other sees them, as political bodies from a politically charged area. And I will quote in here, um, um, which you can see here in this slide. Needless to say, all of these tiny and urgent questions about what kind of aesthetics can be produced under the pressure of neoliberal capital and foreign military domination move right over the head of the so-called German culture of Israeli, proving exactly the point that Kawashi was making. The reaction of the German media to these five collages was fairly predictable and unkind in papers ranging across the political board. I'll share a few little quotes here. Um, so one of them is the humanity, I'm quote, open quote, the humanity that also characterized the cause painting is now completely absent here. All you see are Israeli perpetrators and Palestinian victims, end quote. Or, uh, open quote, Mohammed Kawashi is probably deliberately not showing the worst of his work, anti Israel works in Qatar, end quote. Others outright denied at Kawashi's reality, living under military rule, and spoke of a mediocre collage that wrong wrongfully portrayed Israelis, and quoting Israelis as fascists and aggressors, and the Palestinians as victims and martyrs, end quote. Or, of a open quote, crude analogy between the extermination of the population in the Spanish town of Guernica and Israel's settlement uh, policy, or a perpetrated victim reversal. But, and uh, open quote, the Gaza Guernica cycle by Mohammed al Hawazi distorts the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians and entirely demonizes Israel. End quote. Following Documenta, head of the Fascist Art Department expressed the view that, I uh, open quote, it is simply an absolute historical crime to compare the destruction. 
discrimination and extermination in, in, of Burma in the Basque country, and the plan annihilation of this entire Basque people by Franco and Hitler was discovered in the Gaza Strip, in the Gaza Strip, my title, and your quote. My personal absolute favorite was of the poet Mohammed Khawaj, not only abuses the artist's work, he also turns the great, be liberal, and tolerant, or, and tolerant oriented narratives of Judaism and Christianity into their opposite. You just have to see it terribly often. And of Once again, to quote the artist's own work, Lens of Burnica is a project consisting of several paintings by famous international artists such as Picasso, Dali, Van Gogh, Chagall, and others. They left us all an important cultural heritage over the last two centuries. Through their paintings, we can discover how they live, as well as their society and history. It is in this sense that I would like to introduce my project, in which I present these famous paintings in a contemporary way. I respect and keep their style while adding my own contemporary touch. The reality has changed. Daily life, the social, political, and economic environments are not the same. This directly and indirectly impacts our creative creativity, which is what I show in my paintings. But what was it that bothered the cultural and political elite establishment so much advice about the Kalaji's works in Sweden? Although I quote only media reporters here, both the Chancellor of Germany and the President also weighed in on the Kalaji's works, and other works being anti Semitic at the opening of the show and many times afterwards. To be clear, there were other works by non Palestinian artists that were also submitted to what I jokingly, jokingly call the anti Semitism committee in German media. But it was a Kalaji's work amongst other Palestinian works reviews that was subject, subjected to the most intricate analysis in a 133-page report commissioned by the government to fund the documentary show to external scientific, quote-unquote, scientific experts in the field of art, anti-scientific research and prevention, law and political science, and the minds of the government. So what gives, I ask? It is no secret that Germany's relationship to Palestinian liberation and history is often framed in terms of the country's own genocidal past and its consequent proximity to Israel as the homeland of the Holocaust survivors whose lives are wrecked and whose past it seeks to ameliorate today. Scholar of genocide and political scientist Dirk Moses recently coined the term to catch it in the day um, to describe Germany's self constructed take on its genocidal history and its after effects. Uh, sorry, his catches in debate is crucial in thinking of around the public and the media reaction or non-reaction to Akhawaji's work. According to Moses, the catches are founded on the belief that the Holocaust, according to the German state official memory culture, stands as the unsurpassed instantiation of evil in the history of humanity and has meant that in its demonstration of the remorse, Germany had to maintain a special loyalty to Israel and a dogmatic take on atonement described in official terms, reason of the state. This loyalty translates into a remembrance culture that the German elite uses to think through its post-Holocaust identity that draws a stark line between two memories of violence, one European and the other other, and this could be the members of the other um, migrants living here, so Syrian, Afghani, Iraqi, or even possibly Palestinian. And one memory, the German memory, that all other Germans of non-German backgrounds are deemed to threaten Precisely because they cannot partake in that shared national heritage, that agreed upon authentic experience that embodies what it means to be German. For Germany, then, like Israel, the Palestinians, by their mere existence, are regarded as the existential threat to Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state and the Zionist state on which it was founded. One may argue that the Kawashi was naive in taking the Western universities' print names at their word and requesting politely through an art show for the right to participate by including the story of the people on the margin in the larger picture through painting, the medium of painting. That very medium that self-identified critics of high art regard as the most serious type of art, and the art form least identified with global contemporary art, which they sometimes anyway regard disdainfully. For his critics, not only including the painting of request and his aesthetics, but even refuted his lived reality of Israeli violence as part of their critique of his work by making claims to an occupation that is manifested in bad aesthetics and a violence he only sees in his life. But we also know that the Kawaji is a Palestinian Kawaji, who probably knows all too well that the application of universal equal rights are indeed a Western fantasy. In my reading, what the artist ends up doing in Rasi Jernika, whether it was or not, is take the German reason of state to pass and purposely include, subvert, and draw attention to the very core of the German desire to guard its exclusive post-Holocaust identity by propagating the idea that the nation's cultural sovereignty is at risk every time intertwined go 
of a Muslim who violence abroad in the picture. The artist does it by reminding viewers of the documenta of what many post-colonial critics of German memory culture have long done. That is, that historically and geographically, the German Holocaust has much broader roots than Germany itself, and indeed with respect to racial thinking, colonial conquest, and border crossing, not only in the past, but in the colonial present, as well as, and especially in its refusal to recognize its entangled yet unacknowledged history with the Palestinian predicament. It was this very proposal by Hawaii that multiple and intersecting histories of violence, modernity, and memory can converge on German soil that would speak the biggest affront to German sensibility, and indeed the threat to its national sovereignty over determining the boundaries of its own memory culture. As some of you know already, Germany is today in full swing in what has today become fully recognized as the attempted erasure of Palestine and Palestinian narrative from the German public imaginary through a systematic process of criminalization that seeps into the very core of academic and cultural institutions, as well as even schooling. In 2024, Germany's latest defense and participation through weapon sales and genocide against the Palestinian people and its attempt to eradicate the cultural fabric and memory of Palestine makes the ideals of the rule of law and universal rights and a common humanity that it preached so long in the Middle East through its cultural, social, and educational programs sound even more ludicrous than they ever did. If these supposed ideas sound the color then, they definitely do today. Today and here, I think I argue that they sound simply grotesque. And I use the word grotesque here, not in some kind of emotional, angry way, but very intentionally, and in reference to the way German academic and cultural elites that would hold the mantle of these supposed universal elite ideals have unabashedly taken into enabling the state's support of Israel's war on the Palestinian people and the regime of unquestioning talk that is required to enable the genocide of violence to pass as normal here in Germany. They have therefore willingly allowed themselves to function as traditional technocrats and bureaucrats of the state in the national sense, instead of intellectuals that hold the government in check. This is arguably a serious breach of the trust that the public and students place in these institutions of higher learning and education. Against this backdrop, I unwittingly find myself a happy anthropologist conducting ethnography in a new geographical and discursive site called the German context. This German context, this context in it is one in which mainstream German academia, the media, and the political and cultural elites all dear at the site of collective reckoning of the past. But this site is also a top-down, self-identified, and self-granted state of protectionism and privilege. A place where racist assumptions and perpetrator guilt can be un employed unproblematically and arbitrarily in the name of the state's sovereignty and supposed threat, supposed threatened national security, whenever its political or even economic interests are challenged. As you already know, Palestine and the Palestinians, uh, sorry, Palestine, uh, the Palestinians and their friends in this framework are painted as the real enemy of the state. And the mere footnote in the larger kind of history of Germany and Israel. They are deemed a highly offensive distraction because to the establishment and renewal of intellectual thought amongst elites, they are an embodied reminder of the enduring legacy of the violence of the birth of Israel and its ongoing repercussions today. The Palestinians and, and Palestine are a constant reminder that the plan to overthrow the European problem of racism on another people in another land simply hasn't worked. That very self grant privilege of having a special quote unquote German context that powerfully intervenes in what should normally be the critical spaces of academia and the arts, which tie their priorities today not to the Jewish people in all their diversity, but to the state of Israel's lack of rule of law, is being punctured and interrogated through uncompromising decolonial methods that refuse to fit so around the context that has become one of privilege and violence. Let us not forget that Germany's special context was historically tolerated by the international community. Even everybody, including even Arab states and their population, who were ready to tiptoe around Germany's special situation for the most part of the last 70 or five years, arguably because Germany dished out a lot of money in foreign aid development that was channeled to industry, the NGO, and civil society fields, agriculture, and art and culture, etc. Et but this self granted privilege is increasingly under question. Edward Said once commented that the Palestinians are the victims of Germany's victims. I would agree that the Palestinians today are indeed the victims of the grandchildren of 
some of German victims. The Palestinians are mostly unacknowledged direct victims of German state and elite ideology that know all too well that genocide is not just the physical destruction, the physical death of the people, but the attempt to an intricate web of bureaucracy and propaganda to eradicate the people's ability to produce knowledge in and about themselves on their own terms, while normally normalizing the needs needed to do that. And this has all become more, has, this has become all the more clear in the country. In conclusion, then, let me just say that it is very important that we do not succumb to reading memory culture and the guilt inscribed in it as purely as, as pure as a purely cultural phenomenon, as memory setting approaches tend to emphasize, especially in, in on the German context. Rather, approaching it as a top-down constructed cultural phenomenon reinforced by an intricate political economy of state funding and financial flows and interest groups will allow us to better understand that censorship, deplatforming, and silencing of oppositional voices are not surprising in a liberal democracy, but in fact are part and parcel of its governing structure, a structure that, uh, that a structure that relies on the setting of boundaries of public discourse that is often called upon in times of crisis over identity and contested conceptions of history and trauma and pain. My last point, um, in our world today, we need theories and concepts um, in our classrooms, in our education spaces, and on our screens that reflect who we are. In order to make these, theory, these theories and concepts work and make them applicable, we cannot continue to draw boundaries and territorialize sovereign space um, around our identities and memory. Future studies into the procedural nature of memory and identity construction in the world of movement, we need to reflect the form and constellation post-territorial pain and decision-making that subvert, interrogate, and indeed they bare naked society fall the blind so we may so and, and so we may be able to write the real history of the law one year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hanan. Um, you will stay with us um, for the discussion before I'll also add a brief paper. Um, oh, actually, I also brought slides. Uh, maybe we just uh, unplug this computer for a moment. You will stay. You will see me probably through the camera. I'll just do that. This was a microphone that wasn't so well working. Maybe I, I get it. Hmm? Yeah, I will uh, start with. It's working already. Oh, yeah. With uh, let's say a couple of footnotes and uh, further concepts uh, or contextualizations of what. Uh, what we have just heard, especially what Hanan has said in her last remarks. Um, how did it happen that Palestinian not only resistance or struggle, but existence is framed as anti-Semitic, inherently anti-Semitic in Germany? So what Hanan called grotesque in the end, I think uh, calls for an explanation. And maybe a couple of minimal provocation before I actually read the paper. I don't think this is guilt. I think the whole story is disavowal of guilt. It is, it is the fantasy to go beyond history and to leave history. And if you have followed the debate, you have seen probably that attempts to contextualize, to bring history back, especially October the 7th, are now considered anti-Semitic by themselves. So, history is anti-Semitic, reality is anti-Semitic, existence is anti-Semitic. And from there, I mean, it's kind of a, a gesture of disavowal. I mean, people still, of course, uh, consider speech acts where people say X, Y, Z is anti-Semitic rational speech. I don't, but I think 
there is a symptomatic core that we have to now uh, dig a little bit deeper. Um, but before I go into papers very short, don't worry, I, I, I wanted to show you something more from, let's say, history. You know the German Chancellor, SPD, this is social democracy, he's center of social democracy. Uh, basically no name, like uh, generic, neither bad nor good. A bit of what Angela Merkel is for the uh, liberal conservatives. Uh, he had, you can say, a predecessor in his, um, let's say, ideological landscape that you all probably know, or my generation still knows. He was the chancellor when I grew up in West Germany. Helmut Schmidt, you might remember him. He had a feud with a guy who had a more, let's say, terroristic uh, CV, uh, Begin, as the guy we all know. Uh, this is an interesting uh, debate that they had in 1981-82. So we have here an SPD guy who served in the German army in the Wehrmacht during the Second World War, who gets attacked. Uh, okay, he was on an arms deal, normal visit. You go to a country, you sell German product, nothing special. He went to Saudi Arabia, I guess. So, but then later, uh, he said the following, also uh, allegedly during his journey. In the Palestinian conflict, one cannot simply assign a morality, all morality to one side and shrunk, shrug away the other side. That's impossible. It is particularly impossible for a German, no, West German, living in a divided nation and claiming the right to self-determination for the German people. In that case, the Palestinian, Palestinians' claim to the right of self-determination must also be recognized. This is 1981, normal speech, you would say, absolutely normal. But I just give you this framework to see how far, in more than 40 years, the central, let's say, discourse in Germany has moved away. You can say it's the same guy. Actually, Helmut Schmidt was more of a right-winger in the SPD, in the Social Democratic Party. Even about the PLO, he back then said, let me say one thing with regard to the PLO. If we in the West continue to treat the PLO basically as terrorists and don't learn to differentiate among the faction, um, let me wait a bit smaller, get a bit bigger. Uh, the PLO is, after all, nothing more but, uh, but an umbrella group, and he was aware of that. And if we vilify them, we drive them into the arms of the Soviet Union. Also interesting, it's a Cold War situation still, huh? ideological landscape. Just as context, sorry, I have to make it a bit uh, bigger so you see more. Uh, I cut it, no. Let me uh, switch then to maybe a PDF is better, no? That you can see more. Yeah, I think this should be better, no? So it doesn't cut. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, maybe with this I will start. The original paper was called uh, Germany and its Palestinian Discontents. I, I chose a Freudian title. I think we need psychoanalysis uh, to have a couple of insights here. So the basic doctrine of anti-Palestinian racism in Germany today is very simple. The state that claims to speak in the name of victims murdered in Germany's name cannot itself be a state of injustice, terror, and genocide. For if it were so, Germany's historical balance sheet of atonement might not add up. We know it doesn't add up, and that's why it has to be defended so much. Once an ethnic national state succeeds in defining itself as the sole representative and successor of a victim collective, the victim collective of the Holocaust, then those who resist and fight this ethno-national project must be framed as criminal, terrorist, or barbaric. You heard the speeches. As much as Israel needs German weapons, economic and diplomatic support, Germany needs its Israeli friendship to prove to itself and the world that it has come to terms with its evil past. Palestinian existence spoils this kind of Bildungsroman, evolving story of betterment, of moral reparation, and economic success. So it is about Germany, no? because otherwise, uh, I mean, of course, there are geopolitical interests. There are many things to be said, but the specific German grotesquerie that we were mentioning before has to do with that. It's a kind of a narcissist situation. 
As a result, one can speak of a, let's say, quasi-transcendental anti-Palestinian sentiment in contemporary German politics. This German catechism, and you have heard the word, uh, the phrase already, Hanan mentioned, it's a phrase termed by um, Dirk Moses, catechism, like in the church, no? A doctrine, holds that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism and casts Palestinians as potential anti-Semites until proven otherwise. Not the other way, you don't start with good faith, so you start with minus 10, proof. In this way, Germany's psychopolitical support of Zionism and an ethno-nationally defined Israel, you know, Israel as a Jewish state, you, heard, you know this, acquires a quasi-religious character because there is no discussion. You cannot discuss that in Germany. You're a criminal if you do this. This catechism does not only apply to mainstream political discourse, art and culture and so on, but also organizes whose voices under which conditions are heard in public debates. So in a post-migrant society like Germany, this discursive gatekeeping amounts to backdoor racial profiling. People from non-German backgrounds are expected to learn and get used to this catechism. Actually, you even have this as a question in the questionnaire when you want to obtain for uh, yeah, uh, national, uh, like, uh, naturalization, if you want to obtain German passport. Questions are ridiculous, of course, I can just forever. It has no legal consequence, but it is as crazy as that. By the way, I wonder, do they really believe that people who say yes, sure, yes, sure, do, I mean, if you have to ask them, then you know they don't believe this, actually. I, I, who is the big other to whom they're talking? But don't ask me. In effect, this catechism frames the construction of Palestinian identity under the premises of Israel-related anti-Semitism. Another Zionist talking point, Israel-related anti-Semitism. You know, anti-Semitism, racism, yeah, uh, enemy or uh, discrimination against structural discrimination against a group of people. Uh, uh, defined on racial terms. Uh, state cannot be meant. But anyways, they have uh, invented this. This can even lead to the accusation that the very signifier of Palestine, along with Nakba, apartheid, occupation, or genocide, which you say in Gaza, is perceived as anti-Semitic, or anti-Semitic speech act. A German newspaper even called the slogan Free Palestine a contemporary version of the Nazi salute Heil Hitler. This is the Springer Publishing House. Not Bild, uh, it's the other one, uh, Die Welt. This is the situation. So such bizarre distortions are not accidental, but rely on a specifically German ideology that embraces this sort of, I call it, redemptive Zionism, to allegedly atone for Germany's Nazi past. Such atonement, however, is not the result of working through Germany's past and coming to terms with it. Quite on the contrary, contemporary German Zionism rejects historical guilt. As a post-historical ideology, it seeks to undo the Holocaust, not to work through, to undo, by ideologically embracing, embracing Zionism, which is also an anti-Semitic ideology anyways. So rather than accepting guilt for the Holocaust as inherited historical event, event for the entire humanity, of course, and transforming this affect into political res responsibility to the world, to the human, to your neighbor, such a disavowal of historical reality simply identifies with the position of Zionism up to the degree that Germanness and Israeliness are conflated so that both can become the imagined victim of global anti-Semitism. And you saw the new definitions, Germans can now become the subject of anti-Semitism. You know, you talked bad about German recent of state. Yeah, this is anti-Semitic speech act. Uh, there are not uh, Jewish people involved here, but you know, don't get me into how many German people converted to Judaism, all these fake uh, Jewish spe speak, speech positions in German public and these uh, yeah, culture industry of uh, anti-Semitism watchdogs and uh, uh, commissioners of anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's, I know it's global, it's online here, so I might lose my job, but you know what I think. In extreme consequence, history, historical context, international law, so it is the extreme consequence that then history, historical context, international law, universal values for humanity and human rights are perceived or are possible to perceive them as anti-Semitic. Why? Because they contradict this type of German-Israeli exceptionalism. You are a universalist, you are anti-Semitic. 
because you want to apply universal law to a specific singular case. This is anti-Semitic. And the German case tied to the Israeli is then also part of this exceptionalism. So on the flip side of this ideological conjuncture, Palestine as name, people, land, becomes an inconvenient, if not tabooed, reality. They even uh, get crazy about, uh, no, it's not the land of Palestine. Palestine is uh, whatever the Greeks invented. It doesn't exist. You know, it's really the haunting signifier. In this way, Palestine has also become the symptom of Germany's repress, repressed past. And I mean, I won't get into uh, this more, but Israeli state propaganda now is uh, circulated in German public. It's absolutely fine that states have their public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, everybody has lobby groups, and so on and so on and so on. But that this brochure for schools, which talks about myth Israel 1948 and wants to debunk basically Nakba, Nakba denial, this state funding, this is insane. This is the next level. It basically even dismisses the findings of uh, the so-called new historians, uh, uh, Israeli new historians. I mean, of course, you cannot even take this as a serious speech act in terms of you know, scholarship, rigor, sure there are right-wingers, there are left-wingers, but this is really like a, um, this is a myth, Israel was uh, built on stolen Palestinian land. It's not true. Uh, uh, the the found establishment of Israel was not uh, a consequence of the Holocaust, no. Uh, Israel is not a colonialist project and has nothing to do with imperialism. Uh, Israel is not to be blamed for the Nakba. Crazy, no? Anyways, but um, if you uh, have a bit of humor, dark humor, you will say, the more they say the word Nakba, the less this narrative will work. Because now, uh, the Nakba is even, nobody knew what it is, actually. Who are Palestinians anyway? Some Arabs lost the country. Who? Now, this is big, you know? They brought it to the German public and also those so-called brochures for educational purposes for Berlin schools, especially Neukölln, where most people have migrant background and actually are Palestinian. So this is Germany now. So it follows from this predicament that the study of Palestine is perceived as a distortion to a desired reality, that mainstream German political discourse has constructed of Germany and post-war German identity, and I say West Germany here. United Germany is the uh, success of West Germany. In Germany so far, there is not an institute for Palestine studies. Palestine is scholarly constructed through ideologically invested Israel studies and at best a side aspect in Middle Eastern studies. Palestine as a scholarly topic is openly avoided and framed as a divisive field of study, problematic for future funding applications. While funds for Israel studies and uh, collaborations with Israeli universities are encouraged and funded by the German Research Foundation and other major federal research funds. So, of course, to uh, defund knowledge is part of, I mean, some people have to, to, uh, to buy this, you know. In his path-breaking book, After Evil, sorry, uh, I'll jump a little bit. Actually, the rest, what follows, is a coda, kind of an afterthought. How did we end here? Is the story maybe bigger? And here I refer to uh, After Evil by Robert Meister. And he drew a seemingly contradictory conclusion from this conjuncture. He wrote this in 2011, it was very prophetic. He explains that the bizarre mismatch of Israel's human rights abuses against Palestinians and neighboring populations and Israel's self-image as endangered victim state. Uh, I will... You see uh, the quote, no? Uh, in post-Holocaust debates about human rights, the violence that Israel uses to defend itself has become a laboratory for the violence that the world community, and especially the U.S., would be obliged to use in protecting an Israel. Israel, but also an Israel that could not defend itself. The post-Holocaust security of Israel thus stands as the constitutive exception on which 21st century humanitarianism is based. This is a far-reaching argument. The book has uh, 500, 700 pages. It's basically saying that uh, the more you say the universal applicability of uh, human rights international law uh, should be enforced, the more you actually uh, succumb to the ideological landscape post-1990, which is the emergence of memory and the decline of history, uh, the triumph of uh, Western-style neoliberal capitalism, the end of the Soviet Union, you know, and, of course, uh, 
the singularization of Israel that doesn't have to comply with uh, international law. But the story is, is the following. The phrase constitutive exception points to the nexus of what is considered normal systemic state violence on the one hand and what is exceptional, like sovereign, colonial or otherwise. In 1940, German critic and philosopher Walter Benjamin, you see our poster when we had the Palestine conference on Benjamin, and he said, uh, contended that modern states, in modern states, the state of emergency or martial law, no, state of exception, has transformed itself into the rule. And he wrote it before uh, the Holocaust. But even before <clears throat> the Holocaust, Benjamin says, there is no room for this um, naive astonishment that exceptional acts of state violence are still possible in the 20th century. In the case of systemic state violence and the asymmetry of perpetrators, victims, and beneficiaries, rule and exception are not identical. They are interrelated in the precise sense that the exception becomes the rule by constituting, producing, and testing out the normal functioning of violence. What I want to say, exception is what bases and grounds the normal functioning, that the world in its fantasy, the Western world, the Western community, the world community can imagine itself uh, abiding to international law is based on its constitutive exception of not doing it in Israel, in, in, in the land of, uh, historical land of Palestine. This is the idea. So, and if so, if a law would not uh, grant this constitutive uh, exception, it would be anti-Semitic, right? Like you see, the discourse is already prepared for the uh, South African case. So following Meister's argument, in the exceptional state, exceptional state of the state of Israel, its victims, although ultimately contingent, here it's the Palestinians mostly, also function as the necessary exception to justify the normal, legitimized use of Western state violence, be it peacekeeping, peacemaking, military invasion, war on terror, and so on, the, basic, the, the, the suspension of basic uh, human rights. So in, in this way, the world community becomes the beneficiary of its own declared humanitarian mission and assumes responsibility to protect potential victims or victims of another Holocaust. While the humanitarian rights discourse has, as informed by the world community after 1990, consists in declaring that a new post-ideological age that would repudiate past violence by endorsing exceptional violence, the old Holocaust functions as the foundational crime of this new age. So you have an old one, which is basically the myth, the coming into being of the world order, and yeah, this is the constitutive exception, the constitutive exception that founds the new age post-1990. Evil is in the past, we have atoned, now history is over, we have memory, politics, and the only exception that is allowed would be the founding act itself. This, which would be then uh, Israel. So is Israel, by, by so to speak, allowing this world order, in, it's just in the ideological landscape, to, 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 to be consistent, you know, to, to, to never again, never a Holocaust anywhere, exceptionalizes itself. And you can say, coming full circle now with uh, a genocide that is perpetrated now, which is impossible to think in this ideological framework. You have to abandon then the whole thing. And then, of course, you also have to rework international law completely, and of course, not with uh, 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 member states. And so, I know I'm already talking way too long. Let me skip a little bit. Maybe we can just go for the next uh, slide and go jump directly to the problems of genocide because I just mentioned it. Mm. So you can say. In this way, Israel does not only function as a techno-scientific laboratory for exceptional state violence and its life enforcement, but also as the ideological testing site for the fabrications of justifications of genocide and of uh, ex exceptional state violence. Israel produces and reproduces the ethics of justified killing of unprotected civilians. Of course, the U.S. does the same. Within this humanitarian battle zone, Palestinians, that means civilians and fighters alike, are not only the physical but also the ideological target. The normalization of this type of state violence and its ideological justifications has reached a level 
at which genocide becomes thinkable, a thinkable reality. Genocide is self-defense, self-defense is genocide. And in Germany, you are an anti-Semite when you don't condemn, you know, October the 7th in the same sentence, basically. So the, nobody can come with historical context, or at least even if you would believe that, and by that you would say, yeah, but come on, unproportionate. No, no, self-defense. So self-defense and genocide have been put together, you know, glued together. You cannot even um, uh, argue uh, rational calculus, how many... What, we, what you imagine a terrorist is how many people you want to kill for one terrorist. Even these calculations are not possible there, which are already in themselves uh, dehumanizing. As genocide scholar Dirk Moses argues, genocidal effects are caused by paranoid fantasies of so-called permanent security. Perpetrators preemptively kill entire groups of people in the present in order to achieve guaranteed security in the future. Israel's self-defense and its Western support is based on such a paranoid worldview that actually yields similar effects as explicit genocidal intent. Indeed, the hegemonic version of the human rights discourse holds that human rights and state violence are compatible as long as ideological goals such as peace, security, civilization, and so on can be put forward as legitimization. To be sure, this form of what Moses called liberal permanent security is different from illiberal or openly fascist policies of permanent security. However, both versions share the ideological framework of, and of humanitarian dehumanization. So what we see now is the, uh, in the public discourse vis on Israel, the shift from liberal policy of permanent security to illiberal uh, policy of uh, permanent security. But permanent security was the discourse. This was the discourse all the time. Self-defense, you know, it is legitimate. Um, America has the same. When you go for drone warfare in Afghanistan, you have, I mean, the, 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 you can do this. I mean, that's also the basic uh, idea of why uh, Holocaust is genocide and why slavery is not genocide. Because uh, slavery is just for some, you know, some aims, some teleologies, some, you know, some goods you want to steal, whereas the other one is targeting people who, not for what they do or what they believe, but what they are. This definition of genocide was uh, put forward to exempt UK, uh, uh, British Empire, and American uh, 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 genocides. I mean, so, we, of course, now we even see that this flawed definition of genocide might actually apply to Israel. You, the case is still uh, de debated. But um, I think his point, the Dirk Moses' point, is a very important takeaway message that the very de definition of genocide is flawed, that permanent security as a paranoid uh, uh, extermination program this is the problem. And of course, it has a teleology. It means Israel's security and Palestinians are potential threat. So if they're all dead, then Israel will be safe. I mean, nobody of the Germans would say this directly, but this is still the logic of which. I will stop um, because we have a lot uh, to be debate here, I think. Yeah, let's, let's stop here. Uh, we have enough. Uh, okay. We have half an hour because we started five minutes late. Hanan, you're still here? Good. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's, uh, we have, I'm also strangely the moderator, so um, I will ask you some questions, but I will immediately then open for the public as well, because you have uh, stayed so long. We, um, Hanan, actually, do you want to say something, or Sara, um, before we start? Do you have questions? I will also ask you questions, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I'm very, I have to say, I wanna, I, I'm very excited to hear from the audience, I often wonder um, how it's understood and the sorts of protests, um, in, in especially in parts of the world that we're from. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm very excited to jump into that. So. Yeah. Uh, if you want, directly take the microphone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this amazing uh, panel. So, so um, 
Uh, so my my question uh, maybe maybe broad. I'm I'm like you, the three panelists, but particularly Hanan and Sami. Uh, I thought uh, why this this really this grotesqueness of uh, German position today, but not only German. I would say uh, the the French, particularly. I'm following the French debate and the uh, European Euro American uh, grotesqueness. Uh, and uh, so, so I will tell you how I explain it, and uh, I need uh, your uh, your reaction to it. Uh, so, so for me, in the last twenty years, we move uh, from liberalism, liberal thought, to uh, to what I call symbolic liberalism, which is, uh, I mean, the media, the social science, mainstream, etc. Uh, um, this do, uh, uh, politi uh, political parties uh, become classically liberal, but politically illiberal. And what I mean by politically illiberal, they don't follow, if you like, the the, uh, the thin theology. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the thin the uh, theory of Jean Rawls on political liberalism. It means that how we come into unified conception of justice and we uh, we leave a plurality of the conception of the good what happened in the last 20 years is you extend the conception of justice uh, you make what is universal declaration of human rights as abstractly universal into concretely universal uh, i i work on the three sides if you like gender secularism and uh, and palestinian israeli conflict and in the three sides you find this for instance uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, if I observe the Stiftung, the German Stiftung, they are really amazing how they f they found uh, they they understand abstractly gender uh, uh, equality. They push us to uh, to this direction. Uh, I really I I was amazed uh, by uh, by I don't uh, look at it negatively in the, uh, in that time. But now today, the way, for instance, if I take the same gender, uh, how they the uh, gender fluidity become uh, 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 imposed uh, uh, conception of justice uh, in all culture uh, and and the way they behave in Qatar. Not I'm not talking about uh, criticizing Qatar Qatari authority for decriminalization uh, of uh, LGBTQ community, but how they want the visibility to become. Uh, which is uh, visibility is a part of the conception of the good. It's it's a it's a it's a controversial society should come uh, to regulate it, etc. But they come and they package it as a conception of of justice. And the same thing they are doing it today about their conception of, of what is anti-Semitism, what uh, uh, who uh, who is eligible for justice, who is not eligible for justice. Uh, 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 so so. Uh, and the same thing for secularism. For secularism, uh, France, for instance, passed from a period where secularism wa were tolerant into uh, the new secularism where uh, really it's, uh, it's uh, uh, non-veiling is part of the conception of justice, is part of the conception of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a French secularism. So if you like, I, my, uh, my conclusion is really there is a crisis of, uh, of a distortion of liberalism in, in a horrible way uh, and in these days that we, we are witnessing. Of course, I'm aware how in the history, the, the, these liberals were uh, uh, reluctant to apply it to the, uh, co uh, the colonies outside in India, in Algeria, etc. But, but, but now it's really, a, a, it is within the nation state is applied against the Palestinian community in Germany, as Sarah has said, etc. So this is what is in you. It's not anymore this really disregard the colonies. It's, it's, it's really it's how uh, they have a, a conception uh, that they wanted to impose it to every a single person in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And this is really how, how I explain this, what, what is going on. I know my question is too basic for your much more sophisticated presentations, but I think I would like to read your papers. My question is the following. Okay, so Germany is 
uh, Germany's protection commitment to Israel is part of its atonement. طيب. What prevents it from saying, yes, but Israel has to be, has to respect international law. Why isn't it possible for Germany to make that step? Why is any critique of Israel not possible? I, I know it's a naive question, but I'm curious. Uh, thank you for your rich presentation. Uh, maybe my question is naive too, but uh, I was thinking that uh, the need to link an Akba and Holocaust is sort of a cultural historical violence. And an Nakba is alone is a tragedy and Holocaust it's alone. So why do we always need to assure that Palestinians suffered too as Jewish people did? Uh, another question is that uh, when we are always putting uh, the Holocaust uh, as a reason uh, and in the context of German support of Israel, this, uh, the, uh, this denies that there's a Zionist project that was for Holocaust that it's and in this way there's it's a justification an ongoing justification for German. Thank you. And then, would you start? Ah, it's a good one, yeah. You want to go first? Three questions. You could pick whatever you want. Um, I can answer three. Yes. Because you are yeah, from Berlin. Yes, the sun said. Yes.
hierarchization and also why always together, why Nakba has to be together with Holocaust as if it would be kind of gold standard of uh, memory politics. Hi, Hanan. Uh, but I thought that one of the consequences of the Shoah was to learn to, to reform the education system, no? To have German citizens who can think uh, for themselves. Mahe, critical thinking was part and parcel of this post-Second World War education reform in Germany. Five. Citizens of today, why is it that Germans today cannot say, wait a minute, the state says so and so, but I think differently. I see what is happening, the, no matter how, I mean, I watch ZDF every day, so I know how the news is presented. But, I mean, if I'm a German, I have social media, I look, I have access to other information. So how is it that there isn't a stronger opposition to the state line? Um, is it only the fact that uh, uh, the shame and the guilt, or is it that they, this critical education reform has finally failed and that they still are untertanen? I would like, uh, I would totally, I mean, sorry, it was a question for you, but they're uh, untertan, Heinrich Mann. Exactly. It's the authoritarian personality. So the uh, persistence of certain patterns of non-critical thinking are there. But this is not specific to Germany. It's not specific to Germany. I think specific here is the, the shame aspect in public, the cowardice of many people who do not stand up for what they call critical thinking. I mean, this is but, but also one thing. We ha and this also goes beyond Germany. From the Holocaust history, do you draw a singular uh, a consequence or a universal one. And this is the definition today of what is humanity. If you think there is no universal emancipation, and if it were so, it's either communist or anti-Semitic or both. Or you think everyone on their own, identitarian, ethno-nationalism, and singularity. And this is a fight about singularity. History doesn't exist. No, this is uh, post-fact, post-truth. This memory culture serves the present and the future, not the history. As a friend of mine always joked, who had won the Second World War is not clear. We will see. History doesn't exist. So this is a post-1990 predicament with uh, the memory politics that once the state becomes the state actor of memory politics, history doesn't exist. So history as something that is also counter-history or the whole the idea of history has been attacked by this kind of singularization discourse. And I think a couple of uh, things come here, to, come here together, but I think liberalism you can never explain on the grounds of liberal ideology. Liberalism, if it is still suitable for ideology critique, can only be held to reality. The reality is very simple. Is how, how much is the difference, the gap, between what liberals say and what liberals do. So if you have completely uh, uh, evacuated reality into a psycho, I don't know, cognitive dissonance bubble, there is no point in ideology critique. And I, I cannot study Rawls or whoever 
uh, to give more truth to liberalism than liberals even do. These liberals are post-ideology. You understand? They are not even believing what they're saying. The Germans, to this degree, I think we have many people. We have to be fair here also. We have an elite discourse, ZDF. We have a state, I say propaganda media, I'm sorry to say that, and we have a lot of uh, big newspapers and spineless bureaucrats who don't stand up for their people. We have more than 70% of Germans behind us, but they're useless when they don't go on the street. So here you go with Heinrich Mann. So I think uh, there are many things that come together, and it's fragile. It is so fragile. You touch Palestine and the whole thing falls apart. You should also see this as empowerment. German fragility is a real thing. If you are called anti-Semite today for whatever, for harmless speech act, you see how endangered the whole discourse is. Uh, I haven't answered. Uh, others have been answered. I think the Holocaust Nakba Nexus should be criticized. But of course, uh, without uh, the Holocaust, uh, the, uh, Israel would not have g gotten the international uh, recognition. We know this, but I also think it's a bad idea to always bring Holocaust survivor, or here my Jewish friend also says, my God, you do, I don't need my Jewish friend to tell me humanity, my, my neighbor should also live. This is a universal thing, you know, I, uh, with you. I want to open the mic up. Um, I don't really, um, I think this, um, the culture of uh, conformism is, is a problem, and I would uh, agree with um, with Sami that it's of course not limited to, ger to Germany. I mean, we have this culture everywhere. It's a it's a global phenomenon, and um, it goes um, hand in hand with a phenomenon I would call double speech. And um, I encounter this phenomenon often. I mean, I gave especially after October seven. I was quite often in the media in German uh, speaking media. And um, and I I I hold I give, gave many presentations and what happened often was that people in podium discussions I was uh, with them would 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 behave very cowardly or would um, uh, would um, um, represent mainstream um, like political correct um, uh, positions. But as soon uh, as they left the stage or the panel, the, the podium, um, as soon as they would leave the official setting, however the setting uh, was, and they would change their opinion, they would speak a totally different language and had uh, no shame to, to, to change their posi positionality within minutes. Um, this was really um, striking and um, uh, that that people uh, are able to in inhabit uh, different uh, personalities, different selves, and um, um, that code switching is um, obviously not just something uh, <laughs> which happens, um, yeah, in, in language. So, but it's also something which happens um, uh, in, in a sort of mental space. I don't know. Um, so yeah, uh, I, but I don't know if this, uh, if we have to see this in in the context of German angst. I wouldn't say so. Like German angst is usually the term for for uh, Germans not not um, wanting to to be associated with with anti-Semitism and this this um, yeah and this uh, this mechanism of of um, uh, demonizing every uh, is every sort of Israel critique as, as something. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this uh, culture of conformism and this phenomenon of double speech is, is really um, um, is, is related to the phenomenon of the German angst. I think it goes beyond it, which makes it even worse in my eyes. Yeah, 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 please, please.
yes, can I add just one more point to that? That the, the I mean, the political economy or the aims, the objectives of the players would at least allow us to construct a minimum of rationality to the discourse. And you find this, of course. You can also find a complete cynicism about the people who speak to this group in that way, and you just mentioned it, Sarah, in the other way. We, we all know this. But there are well-meaning people in good faith all for that crazy discourse. And I think that is something that needs to be further examined. Sometimes I find myself in a position, if, if I were uh, 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 counseling the German government, I would say, this is a catastrophe what you're doing. You also ruin your name. And actually for your, uh, uh, for your allegiant, uh, allegiance with Israel, do you really go, have to go that far? Is it really necessary? But it seems that if you admit a single little thing, the whole thing falls apart. But this is the thing in their fantasy. But not only fantasy, because in the fantasy is a splinter of reality. If you say this is a genocide or this goes way beyond you know, crimes against humanity, you may have an echo of that this state and that society is capable of doing that and mobilizing the memory of the Holocaust for doing this. If you once allow for this thought, you may come to the conclusion that the very foundation, the establishment of the state of Israel was a crime in itself. Where do you end up in the end? Then you have in the end a state who is a, is a petty bourgeois villain state who takes bloody money from West Germany to let them wash their name in, in Palestinian blood in order for them to shield them. Actually, only Begin later was smart enough to use anti-Semitism as, you know, as a trope in political speech. The early Zionists didn't do this. They didn't like to be depicted as victims. No? They also shamed Holocaust survivors. There is also a change in the Israeli discourse, of course, from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, especially late 70s. We're now dealing with the ancestors of the Begin discourse, Netanyahu and others, and more right-wingers. So it, 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 it seems if you take on one card, the whole thing falls apart. I think if you are if your friendship and your understanding with your Israeli partners is so thin, what actually is this friendship worth? What is that actually? I mean, there are certain liberal, le liberal left Zionists who would say, sure, settlements, you know, this is illegal and so on, but we have a good core, have a good, you know, there are those people, there are some Germans who believe this as well, but they are less and less and less. More people, and you have to take this seriously, the angst, the fear, to put the hand there is because actually they know, or they, they're not consciously, unconsciously they know that if we take allow too much and give credit to the Palestinian case and what Palestinians see, even if we would say 50 or 10 percent of truth is in what these people are saying, we have a, mon a monster here as a partner. This is the abyss of, really, this is the abyss of morality, the abyss of everything. This is too much. And this is our best partner who has washed our name in public. Maybe we are the same. Maybe we are as bad as them. And this is the fear. So the shame is not just the shame, oh, the other uh, neighbor is talking, uh, give them, talk me with a bad name, or I mean, the state will also defund. But also in the international uh, uh, arena, Anand's point is important. There is money, there is technology, there is clear ex Israel's is more extension of the Western imperial core. You go with that. In the end, you're not much better than them. And this is unconsciously known. So the West also defends itself, its own right of existence as liberal da-da-da-da in aligning itself with Israel. There will be some concessions. Okay, you should not have killed that many people. Maybe this is a massacre at this hospital was not so nice. Sure, there will be some concessions made to polish it a little bit. But at the core, this goes with political, I would say, psycho-political economic complex. And Germany is interesting case. You better study the general symptom in its uh, condition, almost laboratory condition, where it's grown the f further, the craziest, we had heard, uh, grotesque. You can learn something about the others while looking. France is interesting as well because, you know, they have a different history and also you can say that their ideology is more aligned with the imperial economic uh, interests. Classic. British you don't talk about, you know. But the German case is interesting because there is some truth in this ideology. It's an inverted truth. That's why I think critical uh, theory still has something to offer here. And that's why I think it's important to bring psychoanalysis to, to, the, to the debate here.
and it is because it is not just uh, the problem cannot be reduced to political economy. This is why uh, psychoanalysis gives us important insights. You cannot explain how uh, the more vulnerable you are, the more courageous you are. What we see now in the student movements, I mean the students or in the people who have uh, um, a timely limited contracts at universities, I say they are more courageous and outspoken than professors um, in established uh, positions. Um, and, and actually, um, so, so I would say uh, conformism, culture of conformism cannot be um, reduced or uh, uh, solely explained, uh, be explained with a political economy. And there was, um, for example, when we had Corona, during Corona, we had um, actually quite interesting and similar polarizations, like those who were um, uh, for the vaccine and those who were against the vaccine. I mean, the, 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 this culture of either or and of not being able to um, um, think difference um, um, without imagining it in, in, a, in a hierarchical framework. All these issues cannot be um, just, uh, yeah, explained with, uh, with, the, with the, the fear of loss uh, of, your, of your job. That's what I would uh, yeah, think. Yes, <clears throat> where the moderator has 10 minutes after the time to close and thank all of you, the speakers and our host, Institute for Palestine Studies. Uh, we wish we could have been the host at the Orient Institute next year, hopefully. Uh, but uh, thank you for today and we look forward to the next days of the conference.